You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 194, Hebrews chapter 9. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, you getting cold yet? Is it cold up there? It, it is. In fact, I'm I'm doing this episode from my garage, so anybody who watches the live stream knows that it's cold in here. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm feeling it. I'm feeling your, the pain even as we, we do this. Do you have your gloves on? I don't have the gloves on. Uh, I made fun of you just for audience sake, uh, for you wearing gloves in Boston while you were driving because it was cold, but yeah, I didn't think it was cold enough. That's what gloves gloves are for. But you have gloves for when it's warm. Did somebody say, Hey, when it's warm, let's make these thing called gloves. You know, it just kind of looked like racing gloves when you had them on when you're driving. So I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm just, it's foreign to me because it doesn't get that cold here in Texas. So, I mean, it does, but not glove cold wearing, I guess. I don't well, know. I th- those ha- actually had a hole in them, so that that's the one thing I asked my wife for Christmas this year—a a good pair of leather gloves. So, well, there you go. just thought I'd throw that in. And <laughs> you you might want to ask for a fantasy win, just for our listeners. I know they're just on the edge of their seat that we are in the oh, playoffs. If we both win this week, next week we will meet each other in the Super Bowl. So, yeah, kind of looking forward Maybe to that. Will. Hopefully, good luck to you this week and. May we see each other next week in the Super Bowl. That'll be fun. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. I don't want to lose to one of these other teams. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, want to lose at all, but especially not to somebody who, who has a worse record than I do. I hear that. Well, all right, Mike. Well, yeah, let's get into some things that really are important, like yeah. the Bible. Yeah, there we go. There we go. We'll We'll, we'll pull ourselves away here. So we're in Hebrews 9 uh, this time for this episode, and it starts off, you know, kind of, you know, I won't say boring, but just sort of routine. It's a listing of tabernacle furniture. But let's just jump in and I'll read the first five verses. There actually are a couple of interesting things in here, believe it or not. So it begins here. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness, For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. And, of course, you might be saying, well, that's a relief. You know, I don't want to go back and just, you know, talk about all that furniture. Uh, We talked about some of it in our Leviticus series, but there are actually a few items of interest here. Uh, Firstly, did you notice the location of the altar of incense, apparently, at least from this rendering, within the Holy of Holies? That's not where it is in the Exodus accounts and all the accounts of the most the ho- most holy place, the Holy of Holies. The only thing in there is the Ark of the Covenant. But here, I'll, I'll read it again, it's starting in verse 3. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna. And Aaron's staff that budded the tablets of the covenant. So the ark, well, we know that's supposed to be there, but having the golden altar of incense there, that has drawn some attention, as you might imagine, by uh, scholars, both Old and New Testament. But Lane, in his word biblical commentary, actually camps a little bit on this. And it's kind of interesting. So I thought I would read a little bit here to get, uh, again, an item of interest out of the first few verses. He writes, the location of the golden altar of incense within the most holy place is problematical because it is well known that it stood in the holy place just before the inner curtain. That's Exodus 30, verse 6, Exodus 40, verse 26. The scribal tradition represented by Codex B, that's a, a, again, a famous manuscript, an important manuscript, and certain of its allies recognize this problem and sought to resolve it by textual alteration. Now, I'll just stop there. So what what he's saying here is that uh, 
there were some scribes, you know, copyists of the New Testament that saw this problem and actually changed the text to try to fix it. Again, scribes, you know, would, would do this thing on occasion, but it's easy for textual critics, you know, people who are reading and working in the original manuscripts to spot, you know, this, this effort, you know, to, to, you know, amend this problem back to Lane. In the course of Israel's subsequent history, the golden altar was placed within the inner sanctuary. Now, that's 1 Kings 6, 20 and 22. Let me read that. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid an altar of cedar. And in verse 22, and he overlaid the whole house with gold until the house was finished. Also the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. So there's an apparent uh, change of positioning when you get to the temple. But the, the reason this is an issue is because up until this point, the writer of Hebrews has been talking about the tabernacle. Okay, So there's an issue here. So back to Lane. Again, in the course of Israel's subsequent history, the golden altar was placed within the inner sanctuary. And one source nearly contemporary with Hebrews reflects that liturgical tradition. That's from the second apocalypse of Baruch. Uh, and again, there, he, there's a cross-reference between chapter 6 and verse 7 of that pseudepigraphical text and Revelation 8.3, uh, which mentions, again, that this, this golden altar before the throne. Again, you might have wondered about that if you're ever reading th- through Revelation. Well, the throne of God, of course, in, in, the, in the temple context is going to be the ark, you know, the, the ark is his footstool or his seat, depending on which, you know, which historical situation you're in. But Revelation has this altar there as well. So it, again, Lane is, is offering that as a cross-reference to this pseudepigraphical tradition that apparently reflects a, a bit of a change in positioning in 1 Kings 6. But again, we're talking about the tabernacle here in the context of Hebrews, which is why, again, this draws attention. The ser- but back to Lane. The ceremonial prescriptions for the Day of Atonement, however, plainly indicate that this altar was located in the holy place. Again, not the Holy of Holies. He's referring back again to the Torah uh, descriptions of this, uh, of the tabernacle. And this is confirmed by sources contemporary, again, with Hebrews, sources that are contemporary with the book of Hebrews who are commenting on the Torah, you know, on these Exodus passages and Leviticus 16 and whatnot. So it's pretty clear, again, if you're talking about the tabernacle, that the, the, this altar doesn't belong in the Holy of Holies. But nevertheless, the, the, the wording of Hebrews 9 at this point suggests that's where it is. Now back to Lane again. He says, the description in verse 4, this I find interesting, corresponds to the Samaritan Pentateuch recension of Exodus. I'll stop right there. Remember, again, when we talk Old Testament textual criticism, and we did a whole episode on how we got the Hebrew Bible, Most of the time that you talk about the transmission of the Hebrew text, you're talking about the Masoretic tradition and the Septuagint, the Hebrew base that under, you know, is is lying underneath or from which the Septuagint was translated. But there was this third one, the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's just the Pentateuch like it sounds. That's a third different textual tradition, and they're all witnessed among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they all hit the same chronological wall. There's there's no one older than, than the other. They all hit the wall at around, you know, third century BC. So in this case, you actually have what's found in the book of Hebrews reflects the Samaritan Pentateuch text, back to Lane. So the description corresponds to the Samaritan Pentateuch recension of Exodus, in which Exodus 30, 1 through 10, is inserted between Exodus 26, 35 and 36. This was one of the factors that led Scobie, it's a reference to a scholar there, to deduce that the writer of Hebrews was representative of Samaritan Christianity, and that he cites an article. So there was at least one scholar that looked at this and thought, well, maybe the writer of Hebrews, you know, was sort of attached to this community. Back to Lane. The correspondence should be seen rather as evidence of the variety of text types in existence before the standardization of the Masoretic text. Although no Greek text reflecting the proto-Samaritan text of Exodus 26 has yet been recovered, it is probable that the writer of Hebrews was following this textual tradition. That's the end of, of Lane's quote. So what he's saying is it's probably too much to argue that the writer of Hebrews was somehow attached to the Samaritan community. He thinks it's just a, a, a better, a better illust- it's better explained by textual plurality, that there were a lot of old texts of the Old Testament floating around. 
And the one that the writer of Hebrews happened to be referencing has this particular wording, which of course does correspond to the Samaritan Pentateuch recension. Now, again, you could say, well, well, isn't this a mistake? Well, again, if all the texts hit the same chronological wall, you can't necessarily say that the ordering of the material in the Samaritan Pentateuch is wrong. You can't really say that for sure. You can't say it's wrong just because it's not the Masoretic text. And this is a, an interesting example, again, of why I caution people repeatedly to not just give presumptive priority to the Masoretic text. Again, I'm not going to rehearse the content of the episode we did on this. First of all, there is no such thing as the Masoretic text. What we think of as the Masoretic text was created in about 100 AD in an attempt to sort of get rid of textual plurality. Uh, the scribal community, the, the scribes and the, the Pharisees, those who were heavily invested in one of these texts got together around 100 AD and said, hey, let's get rid of all this other stuff. We want to standardize the text, and that's what's going to be our text from here on out in perpetuity. And that's when you have the rise of the, of the class of scribes that we know as the Masoretes. Hence, it was called the Masoretic text because it got passed on from family to family to family, professional scribes. But prior to that time, the Dead Sea Scroll era, again, the, the Second Temple era, you didn't have a standardized text. And so we don't know, if we're going with the older material, if a detail like this was not actually original to the Torah. We just don't know that. We'd have to be omniscient to know that. So what we have, again, is just the writer of Hebrews using a particular text, and that's kind of where we're at you know, with the whole thing. So don't, we don't want to jump to conclusions in any direction that require omniscience. And, and again, without riffing on this too long, it's a myth, again, to perpetuate this notion. The notion itself is a myth. That there's one text that, that was never, you know, never a copyist's error from the, the, the hands of Moses all the way through the, the, the era of the Old Testament on into the Second Temple period and through it into the New Testament and through that up to our present day. That is a myth. It's a demonstrable myth. Uh, we have lots of manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, and we don't. none of us are omniscient. So that's really how we ought to be thinking about this. But again, I just thought I'd camp on that a little bit because it's kind of interesting, you know, that you actually have that reading there. Second thing in the first five verses, let's look at the reference to the mercy seat. This is more germane to the rest of the content and really what, what we've been covering prior uh, in, in previous chapters of Hebrews. It dovetails with the subject matter there much more than a text critical issue. The mercy seat, again, is, is alluded to here. In Hebrew, if you remember back to our Leviticus series, the noun was kaporet, from kpr, pl, kiper, you know, to atone. So it's, the verb is, is to atone is usually how it gets translated. We, if you remember back to our series, I, we talked about the Akkadian uh, cognate to this, the verb kupuru, which does in fact correspond to Hebrew kiper. We, we, you know, quoted some things from Levine's Leviticus commentary, for instance. And that verb, kaporu, clearly means to wipe off or burnish or cleanse, which is why a number of Old Testament scholars prefer to not translate kiper as atone, but something like to purge, to cleanse, you know, this, this idea of purgation, uh, to wipe away impurity or wipe away, get rid of contamination. Now, the noun, kaporet, was the lid of the ark. Now, typically, if, you're, if you've heard King James, and I'm sure there are other translations that do this too, they take kaporet and translate it mercy seat. Again, that's really not what it means. And you, you would ask, well, how'd they get this idea of a seat and then this mercy seat idea? It's not a very good translation. It's, it's a bit misleading, but not in a sinister way. It's only later with the, again, recall Unseen Realm, perhaps, or maybe you've run across this in some other source. It's only later with the giant cherubim in the temple that Yahweh is conceived as enthroned between the cherubim, making the lid of the ark sort of a seat, or in, in, other, in some passages, his footstool. Uh, at least he would be on, on top of it in a seated posture. Again, you get the giant cherubim that sort of forms the seat, which is positioned above the ark, and the ark becomes either the footstool or, or still the, the imagined posterior of the deity, uh, would still be above uh, the ark. Now, you know, that, that's the seated position clearly in the temple. In the tabernacle, you didn't have the giant cherubim, you just had the ark. Uh, 
And so the the assumption was sort of made by the King James translators and lots of people that, well, w- without the giant cherubim, Yahweh was still in a seated posture, and so he must be sitting on the ark between the cherubim, because when you get the big giant cherubim, he's sitting there, they form a throne, and then the ark becomes the footstool. Well, so th- therefore they extrapolate and say, well, back before we had the giant cherubim, we were just in the tabernacle, the, Yahweh must still be conceived of as sitting. Hence, the lid of the ark is a seat. And it's the seat where, you know, kipper, you know, where a quote unquote atonement or purgation happens on the day of atonement. So hence mercy seat. You know, the mercy idea is kind of a, an, an abstract idea. It doesn't really reflect what the verb uh, means. And certainly it doesn't, what that means doesn't get taken into the noun. So there's, there's a bit of a history, you know, a little, little bit of a backdrop and some guesswork here that goes into a translation like mercy seat. Now to the point, the mercy seat, again, or the lid of the ark, was a factor on the Day of Atonement. Now, it doesn't factor in other sacrifices, which were at the altar outside the holy place and the holy of holies. So normally a sacrifice, a sacrifice is going to be outside the holy of holies. Again, we, we know this if we sort of have a basic understanding of you know, the sacrificial system. The Day of Atonement, though, involved this object, the ark with its lid, in a blood ritual. So that, that it was unique there. If you remember back in the Leviticus series, the Day of Atonement was sort of the reset button for the nation. The sins of the people were carried away in combination with the comprehensive purging of sacred space. The, the, the whole idea was to make the sacrificial system and you know the, 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 the holy objects, in, in not only just in the Holy of Holies, but just the whole system and, and all the objects to sort of reset them as though they were they were brand new and like like they're they're made like they were the first time the whole system was used you know that that sort of idea now again the two goats in the day of atonement ceremony the goat that wasn't killed is the one who that carried the sins of the people that was driven outside the camp the one that was killed the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat or the lid and again the inner sanctuary there to purge it of contamination that had nothing to do with the sins of the people. It was that the blood is only placed on these objects, again, to purge it, to decontaminate it, and again, hit the reset button so that now in the new year, everything you know returns full circle and we're all good again. Everything's clean. Everything's pure. Here we go again. That was the idea. Now, the Septuagint is a factor here. Hagner has, has a nice little summary of, of this. He says, the Septuagint regularly translates the noun, again, this, this kiporet, this mercy seat noun, with the word hilasterion, which comes into the New Testament at two important passages. And, and frankly, those are the only two places where hilasterion um, are found in the New Testament. And they are Romans 3.25 and this verse here that we're talking about, Hebrews 9.5. Romans 3.25 says this, talking about Christ, Christ, whom God put forward as a, and the ESV has propitiation, the word is hilasterion, Christ, whom God put forward as a hilasterion by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. And Hagner adds, considerable debate about the meaning of the word in hilasterion took place between C.H. Dodd, who was a New Testament scholar, who argued that the word meant expiation, i.e. a removal of the guilt of sin, and Leon Morris, another New Testament scholar, who argued that it meant propitiation, the appeasing of the anger of God. The King James Version and the New American Standard Bible translate the word as propitiation and the RSV and NAB as expiation. In other words, you get a, get a difference in translations here. Since both ideas, back to Hagner, are probably correct, one can do no better than to translate the word sacrifice of atonement, as do the NIV and the NRSV. The word in Hebrews 9.5, on the other hand, is best translated as place of atonement. The NAB has place of expiation. That's the end of Hagner's quote. You know, I don't really like any of that, (laughs) but I read it because it's common. Uh, You may have come across, you know, this discussion, but it really reflects kind of it reflects a New Testament perspective. You have New Testament scholars who are working in Greek and the Septuagint. They're not going to go back to the Akkadian and, you know, like, well, hey, what does this term actually mean in its ancient Near Eastern context? 
So I would say if you go with the Old Testament meaning of the verb, again, from this Akkadian root, it doesn't mean either expiation, removal of guilt, because the blood isn't applied to anybody in, in the Day of Atonement ritual anyway. And it really doesn't mean a propitiation, like appeasing the anger of God. Again, there, there's no anger dealt with in Leviticus 16. The, the, these ideas are sort of imported because of terms like expiation and propitiation, scholars trying to figure out you know, what, uh, what, what a Greek term means, as opposed to going back and say, look, it means purge, means to, to, to decontaminate. So again, I would say if you go to the Old Testament meaning of the verb in its own context in the ancient Near East, I think we can approach it a little bit differently. And again, I'm willing to say a little bit better. The point of its use, uh, in, I think, in Romans and here in Hebrews 9 and 5 would be that Christ's blood provides access to God's presence. The relationship is restored. It's not under threat of ruination as the year goes by so that it needs resetting every year. You know, Rather, the relationship between sinner and God is permanently healed through Christ. In other words, the access to God is permanently provided. We don't have to worry about the access being contaminated again, just like you did with the Old Testament system. You, you had to have this reset button event to, again, have things just sort of go back to their setting point, back to their original point, and then we, we essentially start over again. Again, remember, the blood in the Day of Atonement ceremony is not applied to a sinner. It's not even a, it doesn't even come from the goat that carries the sin away. The blood is applied to the sanctuary, again, to, the, to, the, to the, the, the holy place, the most holy place, the ark, all that stuff. It's about purging, decontaminating the most sacred presence. And, and when you're equating Jesus with that through the use of hilasterion, which is the Septuagint word for this lid of the ark, I think that there's, there's something really profound here theologically that Christ is better again his sacrifice is better, again, because you don't need to repeat this every year. The presence, you know, the access to the presence of God has been decontaminated, has been opened up, has been, you know, what's the right word here, has been uh, securely provided or made secure or made inviolate through this one sacrifice who is Christ. Okay, the great high priest who offers himself. So I, I think the use of this term, again, is, is really a good one. It's a nice one. It, it's a very theologically pregnant one uh, because of this notion of what happens on the Day of Atonement. Now, drifting into Hebrews 9, 6 through 10, again, this, we, we, I, again what I'm suggesting is that hilasterion here, again, points to the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. And that you know, helps us to drift into the next few verses, uh, verses 6 through 10, where now it shifts from, instead of comments on the furniture, the old tabernacle versus, again, the, the, new, the new tent. I'm drawing that language from chapter 8, where Christ you know, is seated in the heavenly tent next to the majesty on high. Okay, now we drift into specific comments about offerings, their nature and their efficacy. So let's read verses 6 through 10. The writer says, these preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, first section of the tent, tabernacle, performing their ritual duties. But into the second section, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Again, reading a little bit, there, there's, there's a, this is me now, there's a conflation there between the sort of collective sacrifices of the sacrificial system because they were for people and you know unintentional sins that's not actually what's going on in in the, the day of purging the day of atonement because again the sins aren't applied to anyone again it, but it is a reset button so everybody starts again from you know at at, at the you know, the same starting gate so in in that sense you you could say it relates to people but it's it's not a it's not a direct, you know, for forgiveness of sins kind of thing in, in the sense that it's applied to anyone. But he kind of conflates the whole system here with the high priest. And again, I think the reason he's doing that is because it's a start over event. So back to verse seven, into the second section, only the high priest goes and he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. And by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. 
According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body or for the flesh, the word there is sarx in Greek, imposed until the time of reformation. So that's verses 6 through 10. Now, what, what the writer's doing here is he's setting up another comparison to the offering and priesthood of Christ. And that he's going he's gonna to make the comparison sort of in force in verses 11 through 28, but verses 6 to 10 are kind of a setup for what's going to follow in verses 11 through 28. So I want to focus our discussion here, and then we'll read through verses 11 through 28 in light of, of some comments here. It's interesting, just to sort of start off here with, with a, a bit of a random one, uh, but I think one that kind of contextualizes the rest of the comments we'll make about verses 6 through 10. In verse 8, you have this comment. I'll just read it again. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, verse 9, which is symbolic for the present age, blah, 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 blah. What you actually have here is, is sort of a, an inspired side note, an inspired editorial comment about the writer's apparent view of inspiration, the inspiration of his own writing. In other words, the inspiration of his own teaching. He's saying the Holy Spirit is speaking through me to tell you what this stuff meant. Which, again, if, if you're into bibliology, if that's one of your big theological interests, this is an interesting verse because the writer apparently is, is conscious that the Spirit of God is giving them or dispensing or using them, is probably a better way to say it, to produce revelation that, again, God approves of, and this whole lot notion of inspiration. So the New Testament writer, you know, again, has this side comment. And commentators will point out that that the verb indicates here. Go back to verse eight and just once again, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way the holy place is not yet open. Indicates there is a present participle. And so the the grammatical observation many commentators will make from that is that these in, this, this interpretation of the sacrificial system that the writer of Hebrews is engaged in, and again, he's very conscious that the Holy Spirit is guiding him in what he says, that it's ongoing. It's not going to change. This is a transition uh, into you know, the, the, this future time. And, and, and since Christ's offering was eternal, the writer of Hebrews has already covered that. You know, since it, it satisfied God, he's already covered that. Since Jesus, you know, af, after you know, he sacrificed himself and, and, and rose from the dead and ascended, he's seated at the, at the seat of rulership and also the seat of eternal perpetual intercession and he's already covered that. This is this is now the new reality. This is the new, ongoing, not going to be changed reality. So again, the, the grammatical observation is is worth making. Now, this the, the phrase "the way into the holy place" and this notion about let me go back to verse eight again. The way into the holy place not yet open for as long as the first section, first part of the tabernacle is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. Again, this notion of being in this transitional period. Guthrie takes uh, the, this phrasing and, and he comments as follows. He says, what is specifically said to be signified is that an, an obstacle bars the way into the holy of holies, you know, this whole other section of the tabernacle, and thus into the presence of God. Let me just stop there. Remember, think of the Old Testament system that not only couldn't the, the average person get into the Holy of Holies, but none of the priests could either. Only the high priest could go there once a year. So this is an obstacle to the direct presence of God. Back to Guthrie. The way into the sanctuary must here be the inner sanctuary as compared with the outer tabernacle. The words, as long as the outer tent is still standing, seem to mean as long as, the, as, long as approach is dependent on Levitical-type ceremonies which barred all but the high priest from access to the presence of God, and even him for all but one day in the year. The words in parentheses, which is symbolic for the present age, that's the, the parenthetical thought there from Hebrews 9, give some indication of the writer's approach to the whole Levitical system. It was a figure, parabole, Guthrie notes. It was therefore suggestive of deeper truths than it was itself able to fulfill. Moreover, its symbolic purpose seems to be limited to the present age, by which the writer seems to be contrasting it with the future age. Uh, and he, he notes here Hebrews 6.5. Let me just read that verse to you. 
this is the the, the verse that, that refers to having tasted the uh, the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. So it's a, it's like an eschatological flavor. We're back to Guthrie here. So its symbolic purpose seems to be limited to the present age by which the writer seems to be contrasting it with the future age. In the context of thought in this passage, the present age was that which prepared for the appearing of Christ, as noted in verses 11 and following, after which the symbol was fulfilled and therefore ceased to have any function. That's the end of the Guthrie quote. So in, in verses 6 through 10, you have the priests who are allowed to go regularly into the first section. They perform their ritual duties, but only the high priest can go into the second and then only once a year. So you've got a bunch of obstacles to direct access to the presence of God. You have gradations of holiness. Again, even the high priest can go into the most holy place once a year. You have you, know, you, you have basically one shot you know, at this kind of access. Now that is is designed to set up a contrast with Christ, again, whose priesthood we've been discussing since, you know, four or five chapters ago. I mean, Christ has provided this kind of access for everyone, not just year round, but forever. Okay. And, and so th this is setting up another major point of contrast. Now we have one priest, one high priest, Jesus, who permanently is stationed in God's presence. He is the permanent mediator. He is the permanent intercessor. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty. Again, all these terms coming from earlier passages. The old sacrifices, quote, again to quote Hebrews 9, 9, cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, unquote. But instead they deal with food, and drink offerings and washings, you know, again to quote the passage, regulations for the flesh or for the body. This points to Old Testament ritual being about access or restitution or decontaminating the sanctuary from defilement, and then in a very, you know, in, a, in, a, in a progressively limited way. In other words, with all these limitations, it has no permanent value because it has to be repeated. It's incomplete. It, it requires, you know, again and again and again, even the access to the most holy place once a year has to be repeated, you know, once every year. Whereas with Jesus, None of that's the case. And not only is access eternal and permanent, you know, 24-7, 365, forever and ever and ever, not only is that the case, you know, the, to the writer of Hebrews, but the what, what Christ did also covers or satisfies or addresses the conscience of the worshiper, where none of these sacrifices could. They were at, at best about unintentional sins and decontaminating a place at best has nothing to, to, to do with internal dispositions. So this, this notion, again, of, of the conscience of the worshiper, this is, this is referring, again, to internal disposition, cleansing of the conscience, you know, your, your feelings, your mind, your heart, you know, we would say. The, the Old Testament system didn't have anything to do with that. And the Old Testament system was operative, you quote, again, the last verse of Hebrews 6 through 10, or verses 6 through 10. The old, the old system, you know, operative, it operated until the time of Reformation. Uh, it's a term that could be translated new order or new age. It's an unusual expression. It's found nowhere else in the New Testament. Now, Guthrie opines that it is akin to expressions like regeneration. Again, the time of Reformation, de orthoseos, new order, new age, Reformation. Again, if this, is, if this is reflective of an internal disposition, sort of the, the inner life, and, and now, again, in this, in this new age, the, the sacrifices provided by Christ directly address, they involve the heart, the mind, again, the inner life, then I think Guthrie is onto something here that it is like this, this talk of regeneration. Uh, he cites Matthew 19, 28 here which says, Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me also will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he refers there to the new world. Again, this, this, this time in, in, in the future. And so this, this, this notion, again, when he says this, they're in the gospels, he's still there. You know, he's, he's, it's the period of incarnation. It's before the crucifixion, obviously, and, and, and all the rest of you know, what would happen. The writer of Hebrews, again, is drawing on this idea that that was then and this is now. We are now in this time. 
you know, it's, it's the already, but not yet. The, the kingdom of God has already come and it's progressing toward its final, you know, its final culmination, its final fulfillment when all of these things are made earthly in a permanent in an earthly way. But we're still, we're, we're still kind of there. We, we are now again, able to have a system, have a sacrifice, have a high priest, have a means of, of resolution or absolution, again, whatever terms you, you want to apply here that apply to the inner life, that apply to our hearts, our consciences. Again, for the writer of Hebrews, this time had come, and he associates it with the work of Christ. They're already in this time when, you know, we are not only, you know, ruling with Christ, but we are also, you know, we're members of his kingdom. But but again, for the writer of Hebrews in this chapter, what that means is that we are cleansed from within. We are new creatures. We are new creations. Again, that's where Guthrie's drawing on this notion of regeneration, that, that idea that we are made new from the inside out. And the Old Testament sacrificial system could not do this even on its best day, even on the single day when access to the most holy place was allowed. Couldn't do this. So it's a huge contrast. Now, in what follows in the chapter, verses 11 through 28, the writer sort of makes application of these ideas the rest of the way through the chapter, talking about, again, the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the sacrifices, all this stuff. Just listen to what he says in verses 11 through 20, and I'm going to read through it and, and make some, some comments as we go. Verse 11 starts, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. In other words, the heavenly tent, the heavenly sanctuary, God's house, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of majesty. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, that through the greater and more perfect tent, he, t he entered, verse 12, once for all into the holy places. He, not only is he in the better tent, but he doesn't have to leave. He's not going to leave. It's permanent. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Verse 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I'm going to stop there at the end of verse 14. Now look at the difference again. Back to the, in the Leviticus series, we talked about how so much of the sacrificial language was about purging, the, purging sacred space, decontaminating it, or decontaminating people so that they wouldn't defile sacred space. And, you know, what defiled sacred space? Well, you know, what, 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 what made a person sort of a threat? to sacred space back in Leviticus, some physical deficiency, some deformity, the loss of blood, loss of semen, the menstrual cycles, you know, all of these things are associated with the flesh. None of it was associated with the inner life, the inner mind, the heart, the conscience. And so the writer of Hebrews, this is easy pickings for him. I mean, now we're talking about, again, being renewed from the inside out. It is by definition inherently superior because it addresses the heart. It addresses the, the, the soul, okay, what, what Christ did, not just the outer body, the outer flesh. Now, it's interesting in verse 14, he says that Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's interesting that he doesn't say that, we, that it was done to purify our conscience from sin. Now, that speaks still of inner transformation. It, it, it's actually consistent. Paul's new creation, regeneration, why, why does it fit? How does it fit? Because only God can do that. Only God can make any of us a new creation from the inside out. It's a, it's a deep, stark contrast to working, to works, to trying to resolve an inside problem by behaviors or rituals that we do in our body, okay, with our body. So that, that's why that's the point of contrast. 
our conscience is purified apart from dead works. Dead works couldn't pull that off. Okay, that, that's just that's going through the motions again to use a modern phrase. It has nothing to do with with the the making new of what's inside the heart, the soul, the conscience, the mind. Again, whatever whatever terms that you want to apply to this, the spirit. Again, the internal life, the internal you, the real you, the you that's again trapped in a body. Okay, that is what has to be made new for eternal life and what Christ does make new for eternal life. And your works can't touch that. Now, all this is why the Old Testament separates, again, this internal disposition, the internal life, the internal transformation, the matters of the heart. It's why the Old Testament separates such things from sacrifices. Okay, Hosea 6.6, 6. again, a very well-known verse, even if people can't you know, cite the verse reference, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, steadfast love, it's, it's chesed in Hebrew. Again, this loving loyalty idea. That's what God wants, not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God, again, this, this it speaks of intimacy rather than burnt offerings. Again, both, those things ar- arise from the life of the mind, the life of the heart, the inner life, not outer ritual. That, that's why, he, again, he's contrasting this. Into verse 15, we'll start reading again. Therefore, he, Jesus in context, is the mediator of a new covenant, which was associated with the Spirit. You know, think about that. Therefore, he's the mediator of a new covenant. Last episode, we talked about the new covenant a lot. And and we brought up, you know, not only the new covenant passage in Jeremiah, but verses like Ezekiel eleven nineteen. 19. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, so on and so forth. Again, this is to borrow New Testament language here. This is the language of regeneration. This is the lang- language of being made a new creature, a new creation. Back to verse 15, therefore Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, okay, one that involves an internal transformation, not dead works so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Again, no no death of an animal could do that. Verse 16, for where a will is involved, kind of like think of, think of the legal term now, a will, last will and testament, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. That's the end of verse 17. Now, Hagner comments here. He says, the argument of verses 16 and 17 is possible because the Greek word diatheke can mean either covenant or will. Again, that like a last will and testament, depending on the context. Our author now takes the word to mean will. Paul made use of the same double meaning of the word in Galatians 3, 15 through 17. Now, I'm going to stop there in the, in the Hagner quote. In Hebrews 9, uh, he's been using diatheke to speak of covenant, new covenant, and now he's, he's, you know, he, he's getting into sort of like a, a legal context. And Hagner wants to point this out. You know, the, the writer uses the same term here to, to speak of two ideas, covenant or will. And we know it's will here, verses 16 and 17, because he says things like, it involves the death of the one who made it. Will only takes effect at death, you know. So we know it's it's that kind of meaning, but it's the same word. And he's, you know, back to Hagner, he says, Paul makes use of the same double meaning of the word in Galatians 3, 15 through 17. The will of a person takes effect only upon the death of the person. Likewise, a covenant can be established only by blood, that is, by death. In the case of the first covenant by the death of animals, and the case of the new covenant by the death of God's Son. It's the end of the Hagner quote. Verse 18, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. 
And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Again, you needed, think back to our Leviticus series, you needed objects decontaminated okay, to be used in the sacrificial system. You need sacred space, the, the, the tent itself, you know, it's the holy ground. You needed that decontaminated to be able to do you know, what needed to be done. You know, to, in the worship of the Lord and 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 that sort of thing, it was referred to as forgiveness of sins. And if you're again, if you remember the the Leviticus you know series, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, this wasn't referring to any sort of moral transgression. It was referring to some sort of defilement that you either incurred, you know, accidentally, typically, that would defile sacred space, or it it, it referred to an actual you know episode of defilement of sacred space. So you were doing this really to protect holy ground, holy vessels and whatnot. Uh, and and if, you, if you decontaminated yourself, if you brought the right sacrifices, then you were okay. It was okay between you and God. You were allowed to participate. You were allowed on holy ground, but only so far, even if you were clean, because, you know, you have this, this, these, these gradations of holiness. The average person could only go so far approaching sacred space, and the priest could only go so far into sacred space, and, and only one of them could go into the most holy place once a year. So you had these different levels. But most of the system was about protecting holy ground, protecting the vessels, making sure you didn't defile it. And the only way we can make sure you don't defile it is if you bring a sacrifice and then you're decontaminated yourself. So uh, most of this, again, wasn't about you know, moral transgression. You know, there were lots of parts of the law, again, thinking back to our series on Leviticus, that dealt with, well, if you do this particular sin, you make restitution. You know, restitution was the solution. And, and it would involve, you know, some sacrifice that, you know, it's okay between you and God. God knows that you took care of this. You made restitution, so on and so forth. And then there, there were a lot of sins for which there was no sacrifice. You were, it was either the death penalty or exile. And it's quite a different system than, than what's being described here in the book of Hebrews. But his point here is that both the old system, the old covenant, and a new covenant were inaugurated. They were put into effect by blood sacrifice. But the new covenants is better because it was an eternal sacrifice. Why was it eternal? Because it was Jesus. It doesn't have to be repeated. And bonus, it covers the inside, the life of the mind, the life of the heart, the life of the soul, the spirit. Again, the inner disposition. You are made new from the inside out. Okay, that's why Jesus is better, because he's not doing that stuff in, an, in the earthly tent. The earthly tent is passing away and really has passed away as a result of the work of Christ. He is now in the heavenly tent, the superior tent, again, to mimic the, the language of Hebrews earlier, seated at the right hand of majesty on high. He's taken up his, his, his place in God's house, i.e. the heavenly temple, and that is now where you belong because your family, your family because of, of lots of things. Yes, because he offered himself for sin to make you new from the inside out, to give you a new heart. That's true. But you also belong there because he became human. This is back to Hebrews chapter two, the incarnation. All of this was aimed at humans because Jesus became human. He didn't become anything else like an angel or something. You know, it, This is why the, the, the whole system is targeted. You know, One of the reasons is why it's targeting humans. You belong there. You are part of the family now. This is why brother, sibling language is used of Jesus early on in the book of Hebrews. And, and, and God will keep his promises because Jesus did what he did. And, 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 and our gateway to all of this is to believe. You either believe or you don't. And it, it's by faith. Even in Hebrews 9 here, he mentions that it's, this is brought about by faith. So back to verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Again, we're, we're brothers, we're siblings with, with Jesus, Hebrews chapter 2. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, this is verse 25, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. 
But as it is, he, appear, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's the end of the chapter. Now, a few comments on verses 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, notice that the text doesn't say, It's appointed for humans to die once, and then they get another chance. They get another chance at salvation. The text doesn't say that. Now, we've had questions in Q&A about, well, does this verse, you know, somehow, you know, speak of of a new opportunity to be saved? Well, only if you put words into it that aren't there. So Christ, verse 28, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. Okay. Now, I would say here, you know, Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many. It's a pretty plain inclusion of the idea of substitutionary atonement. You know, this is why uh, we, we just had a recent, you know, our little thought experiment with Ron Johnson and Carl Sanders. I, I, I said a few times, look, I'm a big tent guy. I'm a kaleidoscope guy when it comes to the atonement. And I am. The atonement means many different things, one of which is substitution. The other views of the atonement do contribute something. They, they're, they're different aspects, different ways of thinking about what the atonement means, what the sacrifice of Christ means. Unfortunately, the propensity has been both in scholarship and those who imbibe on scholarship or, you know, imbibe on, on how something is preached. The propensity has been, let's pick another view of atonement so we don't have to have this substitution idea because that, that just sounds awful. That just you know, we're, we're, we're just so, we don't want to hear about violence. We don't want to hear about an, an innocent dying for the sins of somebody else. Ooh, that, that's just icky. Our culture just doesn't tolerate that. Well, too bad. Okay, that, that, that's just part, that's a legitimate part of what the atonement means. And you, you do have passages like this one and others that are pretty, use pretty clear substitution language. Again, that's not the only thing that atonement means. Okay, not the only thing, but it's part of what the atonement means. So my advice would be to not try to jettison or excise out of our atonement talk an idea that is clearly there in certain texts, but to include other ideas that can derive from other texts. Again, that's why I'm a kaleidoscope guy when it comes to the atonement. Now, what about the, I should say something about the word many, you know, that he was you know, he was offered once to bear the sins of many. You know, the, uh, there's obviously this gets into you know the, the the whole you know limited atonement Calvinistic you know kind of talk and, and whatnot. I think Hagner has a nice little sort of segue, a little sidebar on this. I'm going to read it to you, and he says this: the word "many" in 9:28 should not be taken literally as limiting the scope of Christ's atoning death, as though some were not meant to be included in its benefit. This is unmistakably clear from this statement in Hebrews 2.9, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2.9, it doesn't say many, it says everyone. Huper pontos. The word many, Hagner continues, probably is to be explained by its occurrence in Isaiah 53.12. Again, quoting the Septuagint, of course. He bore the sins of many a passage understood in the early church as referring to Christ. Depending on the context, many is a Semitic expression that can mean all. Thus, for example, many in Mark 10.45, which says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hagner says, many in Mark 10.45 very probably should be understood as meaning all. And then he has a cross-reference here to 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15, which says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And then he also Cross references 1 Timothy 2 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So basically, what Hagner's saying here is the many can refer to all. And, and again, internally in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9 28 is there, and Hebrews 2 9 
is there. By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It's very clear. So he, he, what he's saying is that this is probably, again, a, a, another way of expressing the same idea, even though the word is different. And we shouldn't create a contradiction between Mark 10.45 and 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15 and 1 Timothy 2.6. Hagner writes, the point is strikingly clear when the many of Romans 5.15 and 5.19 is compared with the parallel statement referring to all in Romans 5.18, right in between those two other verses. All and many are interchanged, is his point. And so he's arguing that that's the way we should read this in, in Hebrews. I agree with him. Again, Hebrews 2.9 is there in the text. Talking about death, same subject matter. So that's really, again, how we should be thinking about this. Now, I want to wrap up with another thing that, that Hagner says. I think it's a good way to, to, to end our episode. Uh, he sort of summarizes you know, Hebrews 9 this way. The reference to the appointed death of humans brings with it the thought of judgment. Again, this once to die, and after this, the judgment. The prospect of the judgment that awaits all, in turn, sharpens the universal need of salvation. The final verse of the chapter offers welcome comfort. It is precisely because Christ, in his single sacrifice, was able to bear the sins of many, a Semitic expression connoting all, that he can appear bringing salvation. He no longer needs to bear sin, that has finally been accomplished for all time on the cross. But he will come a second time to bring salvation in its fullness and perfection to those who eagerly wait for him. In other words, those who believe. That will be the time, Hagner writes, for the harvesting of the fruit already won by Christ. This thought reconfirms the finality and sufficiency of Christ's work on Calvary. So again, the, the chapter ends with a, with a fairly simple point. Christ offered himself, he died, and he will appear again for those who believe. The contrast, of course, is that humans, just generally, are appointed to die. That, that's just the, the inevitability of, of, of human existence. And then they're going to be judged. But if they were believers, judgment isn't what would be awaiting them when Christ returns. They'd be saved when Christ reappears the second time. In other words, they won't suffer the second death described in Revelation. So, you know, Hebrews 9, again, just drawing out more points of the comparison. And I think, you know, again, I just like the way Hagner, Hagner puts that. He no longer needs to bear sin, but has finally been accomplished for all time in the cross. But he will come a second time to bring salvation in its fullness and perfection to those who eagerly wait for him. Okay, Mike, we're getting close to the end of Hebrews. That means we will be yeah. voting again. So everybody get ready for that next month. And then, Mike, next week, we're going to take a break from Hebrews again and do a special Christmas show. Can you tell us what we're going to be talking about? Yeah, we're. I've decided we are going to do an episode on is Christmas pagan, <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it, is Christmas pagan. How should we be thinking about uh, Christmas, uh, with all the the various controversies about what people do to celebrate Christmas and the, you know, the December 25th day and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll devote an episode to that. And we'll have a special guest, Dr. Burton, to help yep. break that down for yep. us. Is that correct? Judd, Judd Burton will be along with us and we're going to sort of tag team that episode, but uh, hopefully it'll be useful and instructive. Okay. I'm looking forward to that episode. Uh, I need to know if I need to take down my wreaths and stop uh, <laughs> doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. So <laughs> well, you, maybe you don't want to just tell us everything you do, Trey. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, knowing you, that, that, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. So let's just, let's leave that there. Okay. Sounds good. All right, Mike. Well, uh, just want to thank you everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.